Yeah, that was an accident that I became an artist. I still don't feel like a real artist. It's very hard to explain to myself why I'm doing it. Just to use those resources, all the money and all the materials and all the time to create something that is visible only for two weeks for 20 or 30 people. I saw that nothing is developing out of this, that is not going anywhere. When it's changed that much that uh, I saw some point in that, that I'm an artist and I'm doing this. Welcome to the Installation Art Podcast, the one and only show that highlights installation art and the stories behind how it gets created. I am your host, Anastasia Parmsen, and on the show today, how Hungarian-Estonian artist Dennis Farkas went from organ building to conceptual art by accident, as he says. We will find out why, at age 36, he decided to quit art. He created an exhibition called Let's Play, The Game Is Over. It was a collection of small booklets that contained all his works, and they were free to take by the audience. We will learn how that turned into him representing Estonia at the Venice Biennale and how he feels about that opportunity in hindsight. His work often stems from language and literature. Dennis uses paper miniatures and photography and his skills in carpentry to create highly conceptual installations. I'm very excited to introduce you to Dennis Farkas. Let's go back to the beginning. Hmm. Uh, where did you grow up? In Hungary. Near Budapest. Okay. Mm. And were you a creative kid? No, I don't think so. No? No. You didn't get into like arts or crafting or? No. Uh, yeah, that was an accident that I became an artist. And I was 23, I think I, I came to Estonia and started to study at the art academy. So first I wanted to study music. Then I realized that's not going to happen. So you you didn't even start. Yeah, basically. But I, but I went to the music at academy at Hungary to study organ building. Oh, so the, wow, that's <laughs> random. Oh well, yes and no. I was uh, I was singing in the choir at the high school, and my teacher was an organ player, mm-hmm. and then he told me that I'm. Probably not going to make into the music world. <laughs> that he That's was, harsh. Yeah, well, he was right. <laughs> uh, but because he knew that I'm sort of good in not carpentry, but in like st- stuff with your hands. Yeah, and uh, and he just asked why I don't try that. And my grandfather at the same time told me that I probably should go to study some real job before the university I think was that was clever and I, I really appreciate or like that he told me that so these two things together led me to to the school where I became basically a carpenter so uh, how long did you do that uh, I studied for two years and then I worked about two or three years or so five you years. were actually building organs yeah. at some point wow that's cool yeah, and that's why I wanted to. I, I became interested in architects, architecture, sorry, and and because I uh, I lived in Finland for a year before, and I, I was really interested in Finland. I I decided that I I try to get into the university there to study architecture. Um, didn't happen, fortunately, <laughs> and uh, and because I had to start to draw for the for the exam. So you didn't draw before that no, at all? No. You had to learn to draw. Yeah. And for me it was a joke in the beginning, but then I did that for two or three years in Budapest at, at the painter's studio who were teaching drawing to people like me mm-hmm. who wanted to get into the to art university. And uh, somehow then the teacher told me that I should try to do printmaking. Mm-hmm. I don't know why, but uh, so many things happened at the same time of that summer. And I visited my grandmother, who used to live in Tallinn. I just walked by the school and then I asked, how could I apply? And then next year I came to study. 
so your grandmother was your connection to Estonia. Yeah. Basically. Yeah, my mother is Estonian. Okay. I knew that she wanted to get into this school when she was young, but uh-huh. uh, but she couldn't. She had to work and, and she went to study different things. Mm. So maybe so, maybe because of that also. Okay. Kind of were inspired by your yeah. mother's dreams. So were your parents supportive of you going to art university? I don't think so. No, what did they think? Yeah, mentally they were supportive, but, but I think my father didn't really uh, believe, and uh, it was really good that he doesn't understand English, but I think he was scared that what is going to happen if I become an artist, that how will I support myself, so the financial the usual problems. The yeah. worry of... And I think yes. he was right. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. Okay. So it's not, it's not easy, but it's manageable, at least, I think. So now he he at least sees that that something is happening that it's not not only a hobby or I'm not just sitting at home and drawing useless pictures or something like that. But I don't know if if they understand what I'm doing. Oh yeah, I can totally relate mm. to that. <laughs> um, yeah, people in my family do not get it. I don't even have to talk to them about it because it's like. Mm. <laughs> but that's okay I just do my thing mm. so you started by studying printmaking then it turned into photography yeah I did my BA in, in printmaking and uh, I mean both in the art academy yeah. in Tallinn and at what point did you know that you know this is it you want to be an artist uh, probably when I started my MA, that uh, the school invited uh, a professor, Jan Kaila from Finland, who was a professor at the, at the Kuvataide Academy and the Art Academy in, in Helsinki. Well, in printmaking, it was fine, and we learned a lot during those four years, but never really heard anything about contemporary art. In printmaking, you learn techniques and stuff but you didn't yeah and it was not very contemporary so the the thing i'm interested now or i became interested when Jan came to teach us and and well what he did was that he realized that we don't know almost anything about contemporary art or what is going on so he just gave a lot of lectures about different stuff but he's interested in he was talking about his own work uh artists etc so what was the like, biggest revelation to you? That I can do whatever I want. Yeah. That it's not uh, not like in printmaking that you have to etch the plate for 20 minutes and then dry for five minutes or whatever. I know it's not like that. But that it's that, more conceptual. Yeah, that I can think and I can, I can really do those things in my head that I wanted to do. Right. Yeah, and I was a little bit scared because I was not, interested really in photography when I went to the photo department but I met uh, Jan before I decided to continue in MA and we had a really nice talk and I I hope we both felt that we we can work together for two years. So you essentially decided to do photography because you knew that he was going to be the teacher yeah, and just learn from somebody rather than learn something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can relate to that. That's that's why I started drawing again in my master's. Because mm. my favorite teacher was all about drawing. Mm. And it was very scary because drawing is such a rudimentary form of art making. And in uni, we were expected to make big stuff. Yeah, I don't know about drawing. I just recently started to draw again. Yeah. It's a lot of fun, but... But I will not show it to anyone. But it's just like a mental exercise, just like r- running. I, I I like to run because I don't have to think. Right. Yeah. Uh, That's at, exactly what drawing is like. Yeah, at least for me. Yeah, yeah. for me too. Mm. <laughs> so, do you keep like a sketchbook or something? Yeah, I have a friend who is who is drawing a lot, and then. 
I thought that I wanted to try that. But I used to draw, of course, sketches for my work, but not not regularly, not like every evening I sit down and then draw for, for an hour or, or so. Is that how you usually begin a project with a sketch? I, I think so. I don't I don't really know. It's just I realized at some point that oh I'm doing this. So at what point did you get into making installations from your work and how mm -hmm. what gave you the idea that you could make an installation? I yeah, I think I I just lost that naivety what i had in my head that that with photography i can tell everything what i want because in the beginning i was fascinated by wolfgang tillmans mm -hmm. the big beautiful color images and i i can tell whatever i want to tell and then i realized that i well i don't have the possibility to create those huge color photographs because of lack of resources Basically. Yeah, and also I had this problem that uh, that I saw, or I understood that people will not see behind the images, or they don't have the time when they go to the gallery, they see the images, they see it, if it's beautiful or not, and then that's it. Of course, there are like 10 or 20 people who, who will try to go behind. But even for me, it was not enough after a three or four shows that I wanted to add something and I started to add text. That was a very classical conceptual move. And then um, probably because of the carpentry background or, or something, I, I started to think more in the space. Or, but it was with the photographs alone also that I was, I was thinking about the gallery space. And so I thought about the exhibitions as installations. Does that mean that your work is always site specific? You first look at the space. Well, at, at least I used to, and I tried to now also, but uh, that's not always possible. But yeah, it depends a lot on the space where the exhibition is. For you, that influences the final yeah. outcome. Yeah. Does it also influence the kind of materials you're going to use? Yeah, everything is one big thing that uh, started um, in Venice when we had a little bit more resources that I could choose the material that I wanted to use and I had a little bit more uh, financial background or money for that. And because it worked that well after that, I tried to use the material that I want and I want to relate to the space also, because in that uh, exhibition, we tried to use material which is very different from the space where we are in. So we really started with, this, with the space. But it's not always that. Sometimes uh, I want to blend in more or it's, it's different every time. But of course, the space is important. When it comes to your studio process, seeing how you're handy with your tools and mm. do you build everything yourself or do you uh, outsource? I try to. Or I, Do you like to? I think yes. And it's much easier to to do it myself than to explain to someone what I want. And I think uh, I, I think that that's the main reason that uh, I'm also working as a technician in museums. And I have to deal a lot with this problem that the artist explains something. And I do something and I try my best, but but still there is always a little bit not always but mostly a bit of miscommunication and the artists then have to try to live with the, the result so you basically have an insight from both sides where as an artist um, trying to convey the final product you want versus as a technician how to understand the mm -hmm. artist and how to deliver what they're maybe asking for mm. That's a unique perspective. Yeah, but it's not, I'm not the only one. It's quite common that artists are technicians, so you have to survive somehow. So what's your favorite part of your whole artistic process? What's your favorite thing to do? Well, creating or the collecting the materials that I want to. Like a use. research? Yeah. How do you do that? Oh, it's very different. I'm... 
for a lot of uh, works, I have to read a lot. Mm -hmm. And then I collect these fragments of text for my things. And I really like that. So that's like literature you read? Yeah. Novels or? Mostly, yeah. But I really enjoyed one work I did based on interviews made with poets. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a, I don't know if it's possible to explain, but uh, but I was in a very empty phase in my life that I didn't want to do anything. And I started to read poetry and I have a very favorite uh, poet in Hungary. Who's this? Uh, Janos Pilinski. He wrote a very compressed, <laughs> I'm not a scientist, I don't know about literature or anything. I don't know what are the right words, but they are, they are like very, very, very tight or, or he really wrote poems with, with three or four words. There are a lot about life and death. And I, and I really like that form and I, I try to use that in my own works also that, that make as clean as possible with as big meaning as possible like a minimalist yeah. form but maximalist yeah. concept something like that right but to concentrate really on what i want to say so i started to read interviews made with with him and then i realized that he was a big uh, friend of ted hughes Pilinski didn't speak english and that Hughes didn't speak hungarian but somehow they met and Hughes then became a translator of his poems and mm. that Hughes was a husband of sylvia plath and so on and so then i started to read interviews with those people and i right. became like a really so you went line. down a rabbit hole yeah is that like a normal thing you go down these little micro obsession yeah. research rabbit holes i think so yeah and uh, it always be become the theme of, of my exhibition or th that happens a lot that i start somewhere and then i find myself somewhere else so i don't start to read the book that i will use this book for the exhibition although it, that happened also so if your work starts often with text and reading and research uh, how does it become a visual format? Well, I, I, yeah, I just a very mystical, but I, I, I think <laughs> I, I start to see some kind of images or ideas of images in my head, and then I, I take my camera and photograph, and then I uh, start to put things together. So you create those images and then photograph them, or you go out looking for them? Mostly I, I know what I want, and I go to photograph, but... Uh, but that, that's the same with the images that I usually find something where I didn't know that it will be there. So it's always a surprise. And now I started to use my old images that I know that I have a lot of things that I never used. So I, I just try to recycle things. There are a lot of ethical problems with uh, with producing stuff that I really want to try to, to use everything I produced and not produce meaningless All right. things more mm -hmm. and i know that i made like hundreds if not thousands of photographs i can deconstruct them and use them because i don't see myself as a real photographer i frame a photograph and put it on the wall although i do that too as a as a part of an installation but that's that's not the main thing so what's and, the main thing i mean i don't want to lie as I, as I did before when I was talking about my work. I, I know that there is a certain kind of uh, yeah aesthetical value or beauty in my work. And I know that that's confusing for a lot of people that they only see this kind of beautiful lines and, and different grays in my images. Well, that's okay. But for me, the whole process or the, the whole outcome with the, all the images and all the installations, like uh, let's say an exhibition or book, uh, the whole thing is important for me. And it was in the beginning when I started to work with galleries, um, a real problem to just like sell one image from this whole thing. Mm -hmm. I don't have anything against that. If someone feels that he or she wants to buy this image and put it in the in the kitchen and and they feel good about that and i'm happy too so but i cannot uh, i cannot think like that that i have to produce for selling some yeah. images i wanted to ask you about that actually um installation is a very 
like a particular medium mm. in that it does consist of multiple elements mm. or like large elements or often site specific or temporary. Mm. So how do you approach that commercial aspect? Is that how it works that uh, people buy single images or objects from the whole? Mm. Yeah, mostly photographs. Yeah. Has anyone ever purchased an installation? I don't think so. I don't remember what we call an installation. I had a, an installation of uh, 80 framed books, but that was already a part of an installation. That was quite a big work. I call it an installation and I sold that kind of works or installations, but not uh, not objects. Mm -hmm. Do you include some kind of um, instructions with that, like how to display it, or is it is that important? To no, you? no. But uh, but often people ask me to explain mm -hmm. how I would like to exhibit those works. I think the biggest problem was with the one work I made. It was regular A4 sheets, like printed papers, I think two or three hundred pieces. And uh, it was exhibited in New York at the art fair. And then uh, and an agent who is buying artworks from the art fair, so for other people or institutions, mm -hmm. he thought that, that this, this work will interest someone he knows. Uh, and I, I sent the work to San Francisco, I think. Okay. But it's just a package with, with printed paper. So then they wrote me that what to do with this mm -hmm. now. And what is going to happen if they nail it to the wall and then they want to use it again. And that's that kind of problems I have with this work. That, uh, so what did you tell them? Was it kind of like Felix Gonzalez Torres that they can just reprint them? Yeah, something like that. Well, that was the first time that now, now we learned... With the, with the galleries more that we should uh, put that in the contract that how many times you can reprint mm. how it how it works i don't really care that i really started to do this work to, not for the money but but because i wanted to uh, use that format just to produce an artwork for 17 euros you go to the print shop and then they print it to you but i kind of like the strangeness in the prices in art world that mm -hmm. how you how you decide that this is going to cost 8,000 euros and this yeah, is 72,000. That, that doesn't make any sense for me. Are you involved in that part with your gallery? I try not to. I gave them the, the right to decide what is the price. I don't have the brain for that. You represented Estonia in the 55th Venice Biennale in 2013, yes. right? Tell me all about it. How on earth did that opportunity come about for you? Yeah, I decided three years before the Biennale that I, I will quit this art. Okay, you wanted and, to quit yeah. being an artist. And I made my game over show. Yeah. Well, now it's easy to speak, but uh, what I, I meant that being an artist in Estonia is uh, it's very, very hard to explain to myself why I'm doing it. That I, I know all the people who are interested in in what i'm doing we can sit down in the bar and talk about what, I, what we are doing i think it's much more interesting than to go to the art exhibition and this is what we are doing anyhow uh, so just to use those resources all the money and all the materials and all the time to create something what is vis visible only for for two weeks for for 20 or 30 people that's nonsense Right. So you felt like uh, it was a waste of resources making art for such a small Yeah, and living audience. very bad so you don't earn any money and you have a family. And then small daughter at home who wants to eat. So uh, you were like, that's it, I quit. You made your last exhibition. Yeah. Let's play game over. Yeah. And what were you going to do after? Did you have a plan? Yeah, I went to work at the Hungarian Institute as a gallerist just to earn money or do something and not thinking about anything else. Was that an opportunity that was kind of like already lined up for you? Yeah, they they asked me to work there, so okay. it was okay. 
Somehow. And it was still art related that I could uh, sort of curate exhibitions and invite artists from Hungary. That was before mm. everything went down. But let's not talk about politics. What mindset were you in when you decided that you were going to quit? I saw that nothing is developing out of this, that there's not not going anywhere, that I'm doing these shows every year in Tallinn and the same galleries. They were the all funded by the state. Yeah. Yeah. And they weren't commercial galleries, no. so you weren't selling anything. No, that was the Artist Union's gallery. It felt like there was no progress and there was no point. Yeah. Yeah. No. And then how did how did that turn into Venice? Then a year after that, the Photographers Union decided to create a sort of triennale or biennale of uh, photography and the photo month. And for the first exhibition, the association I invited Adam Budak to curate this show. And then he made some visits to artists. And then we met and he asked me then if I would be interested to participate in that show. Mm -hmm. I think I said no. And then I said yes. <laughs> he had a very specific uh, idea what I could do. And I think I was not that interested in that. But at that time, I made small paper models at, in my studio, and I was photographing them. But yeah. uh, uh, it was very political in the beginning, and they were all based on some like political ideas. But Adam asked me to, to work with the space of the exhibition. Uh, well, we didn't agree on anything, but uh, after he left, I stayed alone in my studio, and I started to think. And I had 10 rows of, uh, of film. I think I made that, that day or next day uh, small models of the Kumo Art Museum where the show was maybe four or five models and just started to photograph them. So I, I, I shoot the whole ten rows. So I created this work especially for him or for this show. And I used the, the text of uh, what he wrote or what he used for the, for the exhibition. I put them together. I was I participated in that show, and at the same time, the Center of Contemporary Art started. Um, I don't know how you call that um, the competition for the pavilion. I guess they they do like a short list, or how, how does it work actually? No, in you can uh, you, you can apply, or we could at uh, that time. I think it's the same now, but uh, you can apply. Yeah, you have to have a curator and uh, and the concept and and the artist or artists. So it uh, it didn't matter at that time if the curator applies or, or the artist applies, but they needed a curator or the whole team. So, so you write a project, you submit it. Yeah, I asked uh, I asked Adam. He was working in Washington DC at that time, and I I wrote him that if he would be interested. And for me, I did it because that made some sense, at least to do something big and not to continue this uh, telling gallery based thing. And we won. So how how far in advance did you know? How much time did you have to prepare? Well, a lot. We worked on the project for half year before we applied. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so then we had a year or something to. You took a while to prepare. It. Yeah, but Adam gave me a book of five hundred pages in English, so I used the first two months to just to read that book. So, so and it was not very. Easy to read. What was that like, making work for such a huge project and having all that time? Uh, I, I felt good, but uh, but I started to stress out in the end, of course. Yeah, like how many months in? I, I don't want to go very deep into that, but we had some struggles. We had a very big team and uh, Adam was in the States and then later in Poland, I think, and then... Uh, we worked with an architect, Markus Miesen, and his studio, and he was in Berlin uh, with architects from Portugal and Ukraine, and then uh, graphic designers from London, uh, and I was in wow. Estonia. So, so that that was like a huge international collaboration, remote work, and yeah. that was back in 2012, 13. Yeah. Um, there must have been some roadblocks. Yeah, um, I mean, I was very naive and I didn't know anything about 
about anything, how to work together, and I'm not like this. Oh, fantastic, let's do this type. Uh, so I, I really need to think, and I'm very bad in emotions, maybe. And that was also a problem that some of the people, they used to work in this uh, very busy uh, situations that you need really fast answers and you have to decide you want this or this and let's move on and let's do it and I'm really not like that so you're so. more like I need some time to yeah. think and be in the yeah and that that, mm -hmm. that was a little bit of a problem and also the the money that we, of course we had uh, the state support but it was very limited for me it was a huge money but for people working uh, in big museums and big shows and with big names that for them this money was nothing so mm. this kind of problems we had that what can we afford and what not and then i think thanks to the center the cca we managed to create a very nice exhibition or, or i really liked it and i usually don't like would you say that in that collaboration process the hardest part for you was communication or was there other stuff like technical issues? No communication, but funnily the exhibition was about the impossibilities of communication. So that worked well. So it was proof of concept. Yeah. We laughed afterwards about that. I, I was really interested in the impossibilities of uh, understanding or translation or, or language. Or... Did you ever meet with the whole team together in one physical place? Yeah, most of them came to Tallinn for a press conference some some months before the exhibition. Right, but not during the main process of working on it. Yeah, we met once in Venice with the curator and the architect. Yes, there was no Zoom back then. No, <laughs> we Skyped. <laughs> right, okay, right, sure, Skype, yes, forget. <laughs> but I think only once or twice, so it was emailing a lot. And, and that was good for me. I, I could think a little bit, and because of the time difference and everything, I had some time to respond. Were most of the physical objects and items made here in, in town? Yeah. You made them? No, uh, for that, I had a team and we let one company to prefabricate things from the drawings of the, the architects mm -hmm. and there were a lot of miscommunication also so we had to work a lot in in venice to fix problems yeah now i see that uh, we should have work more here or now i really like to build everything before i show them if it's possible but of course uh, you need space and the tools and everything because you had like a room within a room in Venice, yeah. uh, which you then built here and transported there. Yeah, but we never built it here. We just uh, fabricated the parts the and parts, then we started to build like a, there. Like a prefab yeah. module. And you would have preferred to do a whole thing. Yeah, because it didn't really work there, so the technicians had to rebuild a lot of things. And they asked me things when I was super stressed. Mm -hmm. And then they asked me if they can cut 20 centimeters short of the whole thing. And I said, of course you can do it. And then I started to think that that was not a good idea. But they made it work. So, so really, thanks to them, it worked in the end. But it was a lot of stress for them and for me also. Also, transporting stuff to Venice, installing in Venice. Mm. That's like a whole different universe. Yeah, fortunately, I, I didn't have to do anything. You didn't have to be part of that. That sounds really stressful to me. Yeah, it's probably the worst place to do this kind of show. Yeah, like bringing in large things on mm -hmm. boats. Yeah, and our <laughs> exhibition was on the third floor. And like seven tons or something, the whole thing weighed. That was a lot. Right. So you got there after the stuff was brought in? No, I have to bring them in. So I was okay. over there working the whole thing. Wow. Yeah, but I would do it again. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of fun in the end. How long did it take to set it all up? I from... don't remember, but a month. Okay. Probably. That's a long install. Yeah. So what, what are you like during install period? Are you focused? Calm. Not calm. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Yeah, I'm more and more lazy and calm now, mm-hmm. but that was not then. So you said that the technicians wanted to chop something off and you're like, yeah, sure, go ahead. But No, just because I just realized that I cannot think anymore, right? So stress because of that. You sure. kind of, you're like, okay, whatever. Yeah. At some point. That's what I'm like. Mm. So that sounds complicated. How long did you spend in Venice all total? Did you just open and then leave? Yeah, we stayed a little bit afterwards. That was a fun part, that when everything was open. In Venice, I liked the most before the real opening, that everything is open. I stayed there for a week. Before the opening, uh, people just came in the uh, and they really talked to me and they really asked questions and I met a lot of interesting people and that was that was really nice. People who really get it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really liked in our pavilion that uh, it's outside of the, the main events or it's part of the main event, of course, as it is a national pavilion, but, uh, but a lot less people go outside of the main exhibition mm. venues who really comes there they are mostly interested in that specific uh, yeah or or in in art special because yeah. there is a lot of people who go to giardini to see just uh, the thing but don't know anything about it there are a lot of big numbers but uh, but i really like that that maybe not that many people but they really were interested or they, or they seemed interested at least is it important to you the audience participation and how they receive your work yeah i think so yeah i like to i like to see how the people or the audience responds to my work like in venice i had this library with uh, with thousands of books and i i didn't want to put any signs that please take a book or or don't touch the books that I, I was interested in that what people will do and it worked on very different levels that some people came and they didn't know what to do and were scared to touch the books but i think it worked visually also that it was nice with the thousands of words on the spines of the book some people just immediately took a book and started to read it and also some people just took 10 books to the bag and walked away with them that that was fine also but then we had a show in in Kumo the art museum here uh, almost all the works from Venice and also this library and I told the guards that it's okay that people take or touch the books but they told me that uh, that it's not okay to touch things in the museum so they will not let people. oh really so we had this they contradicted the yeah. artist but some of my friends went to the, the exhibition just because of that they wanted to steal books so and some of them managed to do that did you do a count like how many books you started with in venice and how yeah many? we had ten thousand. so the basic idea was to create ten thousand books because uh well that's a very long story but uh, so these books all the books have the same images and text inside but the but a different title and when you step into the library, you just see the different words. But 10,000 words is a vocabulary of, of a kind of well-educated English-speaking okay. person. So you can put together whatever stories from these words. These were the words of a specific uh, story of Ludwig Wittgenstein from the book where I was working with. I took 10,000 different words from this book. It was Bruce Duffy's book called The World As I Found It. And it's a semi-fictional biography of Ludwig Wittgenstein. So how many did you end up yeah, with? Uh, in the end? Always after the exhibitions, I have to pack it. So now I know after the last exhibition, we ended up with a little bit more than 4,000 books. So a lot of them are gone now. So the starting point was 10,000, but you've never reprinted the missing books yeah they just keep vanishing yeah. little by little at every exhibition yeah we had this problem in venice that it was on the third floor in an old uh, palazzo in the middle of the floor this uh, construction already was one and a half tons and then we had the books on the paper they weighed seven tons so it was a lot and then then we put all the books into the library and went home and then we decided with Maria Rousseau, who is the head of the, the Contemporary Arts uh, Center, 
who was responsible for the pavilion and everything that is working, that uh, I told her that we had to go back and took some of the books from the library because the whole building will collapse. Then we decided to keep around 6,000 books, but it was still a lot. Fortunately, nothing happened. Do you ever adjust the installation based on the new space? Well, we had to because uh, originally it was built for that specific apartment in Venice with the one large room and four small rooms. Mm -hmm. But all the other spaces are so different that you have to you have to adjust. And this exhibition with all the small installations together we only showed in Tallinn. Mm -hmm. because it, it is very heavy or very hard to move and to build this library it takes weeks mm -hmm. so there's a lot of work and it's not so easy to show do you always have to rebuild it from scratch yeah i try to keep the parts at least but now yeah i have to pay for the storage every month so and it's a lot so now i started to build other stuff from this material right that's another question I have. What usually happens to the materials or like the big stuff mm -hmm. you use to make the installation works? I keep some of them, but I rebuild. You them recycle more. them, yeah. basically. It's not that important. We have all the drawings and everything. If someone really wants to buy it or show it, then it's possible to rebuild. Mm hmm and are you concerned about like the archival quality of your work? No. I know that uh, it's almost impossible to keep them as they are. And I, I'm really interested in this changing in the material mm -hmm. also. I work with very cheap materials that I print my images on regular like office paper. Right. You don't care about like archival artist paper no. or whatever. No, not always. Maybe because I became older. But I, I like this big framed photographs also. And they are printed in, in a place where they know what they are doing. But, uh, but I really like them as part of my installations. How did that whole Venice thing, that experience, change things for you as an artist? I read somewhere that you said you felt like you weren't a real artist before that i still don't feel like a real artist what's a real artist i don't know but uh, yeah to be honest i was a little bit disappointed after that oh, Why? that we made this big effort and a lot of work and everything and uh, yeah, i'm working with galleries but uh, did the galleries come from that yeah how did that come about? Did they approach you? Yeah, because uh, I'm, I'm working now with the Hungarian gallery, Annie Molnar, and uh, Annie came to me in Venice uh, that she saw my name on the street, that Hungarian name in Estonian pavilion, and she was interested. And then another Hungarian gallerist came, but we made a little bit of a conflict in the Hungarian gallery scene at who was first. And then with Annie, we went to Arco in Madrid to the art fair next year. And then a Spanish gallery from Sevilla, uh, Alarcon Criado, came to ask if I want to work with them also. And because Ani was fine with it, the Hungarian gallery, so I started to work with them. Through them, I met some Latin American people, artists and curators and, and so on. And I think that was the most interesting, that art scene, especially I think in Colombia, that they're sincerely interested in that kind of thing that I'm, I'm doing. And okay. that was really like really classic conceptual art with a Latin American twist. So we did right. with some humor, yeah. but very clean. And then I went to Argentina, to Buenos Aires, uh, to a residency. And I met some Colombian artists there and curators, and it was really nice. So you kind of found your crowd. Yeah, but it cannot be farther away. Yeah, so well. so that's, and then unfortunately this uh, virus came to mess up everything. So I couldn't go back. I almost uh, bought my plane ticket back to Argentina when I couldn't go anymore. I don't know what's going to happen next. So that, that was nice that I found some people because of, of that, I think.
But um, yeah, I think I hope that there will be a little bit more. I'm not really interested in this gallery representation or that part, which is nice also, but uh, but I cannot produce works just for money or for mm. the galleries. And of course, they would like that. They'd like you to make more. Smaller and more. Mm -hmm. Sellable work, yeah. commercial works. Right. Yeah, and uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, and I understand that that is the business and I get my part, so it's okay. But uh, I'm really bad in this representing myself and uh, to keep the connection with the contacts and then go to be part of bigger shows or something in museums. And my works are very hard to show. I know that. So Why do you think that? Physically and maybe visually also to understand that they are not like that easily accessible. Mm -hmm. I think that's why they don't work that well in a group show, maybe. Or I don't know. When it's changed that much that uh, I saw some point in that, that I'm an artist and I'm doing this. Still, I wake up every morning and I think that if I should do something else, I think the, the, the technician job is keeping me alive. And I also went to school to study house building. To oh, have really? This, uh, midlife crisis but that was that was a lot of fun and uh, you liked it yeah and are you doing some of that now have you worked in that yeah area? and i'm still working in real buildings now okay. that's also like running and drawing that's just you go to work in the morning and then you build stuff <laughs> just not uh, based on ideas but based on actual like drawings that something concrete yeah do you like that yeah I'm, of course, fortunate that I can do that, that I decided I work now two weeks and then I work two weeks and I don't have to do that every day. Like a lot of people, I like this freedom. I think that's the most important why I'm still an artist and I'm not working in an office or something. The flexibility. Yeah. Do you think you could not make art? Yeah. I never know if next day I will, <laughs> I will be able to, to think or... But I'm still thinking. I wake up and I'm thinking now I'm working on a, a project which will open in October in Iceland. Mm. And I will not see the work before I start to install it. So it will be a challenge. And working outside. And I've never been in, in Reykjavik, but I heard that the weather is not so friendly there. In October, probably not. Mm. Bring your warm clothes. I will. I have to glue posters like 300 on the wall. Then write on them so okay you're doing like a site-specific yeah. in-situ thing yeah oh, cool but i have to think about it every day what will i need and that's that's good i like the process yeah i don't like the exhibitions as much anymore there is always i wanted to to change or not working for me anymore or, and that was funny in Venice that it didn't happen, that everything was in the, in the right place. That we had really the time and the team to work on everything and work on every detail. I would really like to do more of that. Like a big collaborative yeah. project with high budget. I think the budget is not that important even. Uh, we made an exhibition then with, uh, with Ingrid Rudi, a curator in the Contemporary Art Museum here in Estonia. Um, and we had time. And I really enjoyed that too, but uh, in the end, that was a little bit too big. Big in what sense? Like a lot of space to fill. Oh, okay. It would have been good to have more months, like a half a year or a year or something. So for this project, um, I, I would really like to do, I need two or three years. Mm -hmm. And you don't always have this or never that you don't have to work and you can, you can do this kind of thing. If you could just wave a magic wand right now and do like a dream project mm. in terms of like whatever size, location, materials, collaborators, what would you do? Um, probably a lot of things. In location, I know that I would like to do an exhibition in Madrid, mm -hmm. like in Reina Sofia. Is my favorite museum, I think. If if it's a museum, but there are a lot of other spaces, but that's a long, long story. I don't want to say any names, but there are, of course, people with whom I would like to work, I think. Yeah, I don't think it's ever going to happen, but 
do you have already like a vision as in do you have an idea of what it would look like yeah um like in venice and a little bit after i was really fascinated by these big stories like ludwig wittgenstein and uh about the poets and even i made a project about not uh, not believing in god easy subject yeah <laughs> And now I'm, lately I'm, I'm more interested in more personal stuff that I really believe that you you cannot lie. When you start to lie or you start to talk about things that you don't know, it will be immediately visible or understandable that, that it's not working. And the only things I don't lie about is what I really know and I really know myself or my own experiences. But I also interested in that that I cannot say everything out loud in in the exhibition because I will hurt people or you just cannot say all the things what you want. I'm really interested in this uh, border between that what you can say and what you cannot say, but still saying all you want. Okay. I don't know if I can explain that, but in Argentina I had a lot of time for myself and then i started to read uh, poems there also and learning spanish so i was reading poems in spanish which was a lot of fun i didn't understand a lot of things but uh, somehow i ended up with a poetess from the united states i don't know why her poems were translated to spanish so accidentally really i i found her who, who? uh tracy brimhall I really enjoyed her her poems, and then, and then I later I made an exhibition in Tartu based on her poems. He had a line in one uh, poem I really liked that, uh, and I cover your ears and tell you the truth. And I made a neon sign out of this for my exhibition, and I wrote to her also that I will use her text, and she was okay. I think about that. That is what I that I wanted to say, or that I really can relate to that. Mm -hmm. that is so abstract what I'm or looks abstract what I'm saying that, that I don't I hopefully don't hurt anyone with that but still saying it what I feel so so it, yeah it's a much more personal and then if I create some space I, I want to work more with uh, with materials that I really know or I'm really living with that I'm, I'm using furniture really at my home and then I put it into the exhibition. So you want to basically start bringing your personal life into the exhibition space? Yeah, but still to create a, a story of what other people can enjoy also. It is not the biography, but yeah, uh, but experiences more. Mm -hmm. Cool. I hope so. <laughs> so whereabouts are you living and working now? That's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm now traveling between Budapest and Tallinn, more or less two weeks here and two weeks there. Sounds complicated. It is. But now this is the best solution for many reasons. That must also then influence your work process a lot. Yeah, well, I have a lot of time at airports and, and airplanes to read, and that's the only thing I enjoy. That I remember that when I started to study in the high school in Budapest, so I had to travel one and a half hour every day to the school and one and a half hour from the school. So I had a lot of time to read. I read a lot. Mm -hmm. So now I can do the same again. But yeah, that's not the, not the ideal solution. No. It doesn't sound like the ideal environment to actually make. No, I'm really sorry about that. Yeah. But um, that, that is my dream now that I have a van or I have that van for many years, but I started to rebuild it so I can live in, in that at least partly. And... You're getting into van life. Are you going to turn it into like a mobile art studio? I don't know yet. I just know that I need something that I can move around. But we have a nice studio with my friend we are renting, and that's that's a good place to be. In Tallinn? Be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you able to just leave your work there while you go off? Yeah. And then come back to it? You don't well, have to, we like... Well, we started in the beginning, or we just moved from an older place. Um, but yes, we have big hopes. That's... Okay, that is the main thing. Yeah. What has been the hardest truth that you have had to learn 
as an artist or about being an artist? Hmm, I really don't know. I think I'm too naive or I don't, maybe I don't understand some situations where I should do something what I don't want to do because then I just don't do it. And I know that some other people just, uh, yeah, swallow the pill, but I don't even think about it. But that's because I'm so ethical, but I'm just this naivety <laughs> that I don't know that now this is the point where I had to do something what I don't want to do. Have you said no a lot to propositions and projects? No, but no one really appro <laughs> approached like where I, I think it's never really happened that I had to say no. I just realized in some situations that I uh, I didn't say what I was supposed to say or something like that. But fortunately, I don't understand what was that what I missed. So I think that's why I don't have this hard truth experience. Yeah. That's kind of like being in between cultures and languages thing mm. as well. Do you feel like that informs your work and how you are as an artist as well? Yeah, well, that was the beginning of my real artworks. That I, I was working with lang language or with the translation or the impossibilities that I, I made a lot of work based on that. That's mostly why I, I started to use text to, not to explain what I'm photographing, but to bring these words together. Uh, for me, the visuality is very important, but the, it's also important that I have to think in different languages and these words are impossible to translate that I know in Finnish, in Estonian and in English and in Hungarian, these words. And I, I know that they have the same meaning in the okay. dictionary, uh, but they don't have the same meaning when I'm saying them to different people in different situations and in different languages. So I was really fascinated about that. It sounds like you're like hyper aware of how people hear you or perceive you or uh, understand you yeah i think so or don't understand you yeah i think it's impossible to understand each other so that's the that's the starting point and that's that's how we are humans and that's how the the world is like that that if i say something you will understand it of course but you will think about different things that i'm thinking about and that's okay i'm really fascinated by that okay the filter that we all have to receive yeah. information that's like our personal experience. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, just wrapping up, do you have anything coming up in the near future? Yeah, I have an idea of, of an exhibition in one of the galleries I'm working with. Like a solo show? Yeah, we had several ideas to work with other artists, okay. but not anything specific yet. So you like to collaborate with other artists? I like the idea of collaborations. Usually it, it <laughs> doesn't work. <laughs> or no, I'm lying. I had some really great experiences with other artists also, but uh, but sometimes it's very different from what I imagined. Okay. But uh, maybe now it will work. Maybe this time. Yeah, maybe. And then I have to decide what to do with my own life. So it's right. in between things. So um, where can people find you? Instagram. <laughs> What's your Instagram handle? I don't even know. It's really <laughs> related to my name, I think. Danish Farkas. Okay, I'll, I'll put it in the show notes for everyone. <laughs> okay, the link. Thank you. I will check it. <laughs> I will know. I have a website, but it was hacked. Really? Yeah, and that was a funny story because a curator called me that you oh, you have a really nice post-internet website. Then I understood that it was hacked and some windows were popping and everything, and it was really post-internet, but that's not what I'm doing. I hate updating websites. Mm. But there is some information. Okay, it's so we'll put your website... Um, and to finish off, what advice would you give to an aspiring artist who's just getting into like installation work and uh, wondering how the hell they're going to make it? Try a lot different things and, and be patient. I think that's the most important thing. Patience. Yeah. 
you just have to deal with uh, with the mistakes and everything. But I'm a really big fan of mistakes, so that's that's cool. But yeah, you don't have the money, you don't have the materials, you don't know who could help you. But in the end, if you really want to do something, I think I really believe in that that it it, it is going to work. I don't know who said that, yeah, that that you cannot lie. That's the most important thing for me. That immediately, if you lie, it just doesn't work. It falls apart. So you have to be honest. Yeah, and nothing else. Not the budget or not the materials or nothing is that important really Re you really can produce artwork from like 10 euros so how do you keep yourself honest as an artist i think so it's just natural that uh, that you are you are dealing with stuff that you really know that you are saying things that you're really sure of it may it may be not the truth or but it's the truth for me mm -hmm. Uh, Jan Kaila, the professor who started the MA program, he always said that, that ah, this is the work of this and that, and then some people think this is bullshit, and then some people think this is bullshit. And then with my Finnish friend, we decided to go to the zoo and took pictures of not bullshit, but other animals. <laughs> pieces and then we made postcards and then the Finnish embassy paid for that postcards and then they sold what we did. But they were really people who understood the humor behind it. But really like visually nice nice postcard that this is not bullshit. Not bullshit. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the not lying thing is really easy. That you don't have to make up stuff what you don't know. And that's it. That was Danish Farkas. Based in Tallinn and Budapest, he is represented by Ani Molnar Gallery in Budapest and Alarcon Criado Gallery in Sevilla. You can find out more about his work on his website denishfarkas.com and on his Instagram denish underscore k underscore farkas. All links are in the show notes. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Installation Art Podcast. If you enjoyed this show, hit subscribe now and wait for the next episode in two weeks.